Good morning, church. Let's begin the message with prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we pray at this time that you would silence in each of us any voice but yours, that hearing your word we may believe, and believing your word we may obey your will. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I am speaking from the river, and I am in the Beckleen Park, and as soon as I begin recording it keeps getting windy, so if you hear a little bit on the microphone, my apologies for that. Um, but this is the Beckleen Park, and there was someone at our church named Ly uh, Lyle Swedeen who played keyboard for many, many years. And uh, Lyle's ancestors were among the people that homesteaded this park over 100 years ago. And it always had a special place in his heart. And so we would talk about it on occasion. It's not all that far away from where I live. And Lyle said that the time came one day when the family decided to sell, and they had two options. They could sell it for a lot of money, and it would go to fewer people if they parceled it off. Or he said they could sell it and make less money, but make it available to everyone as a park. And in the end, they chose to sell it to the county and the state as a park, and now it's ours. And it's such a beautiful place. You can uh, wander through the tall white pines right over there, and you can go walk along the river down here, down there. There's a boat launch if you want to go boating. And you can just walk in nature. It's a beautiful gift that we have, and it's free. And it's available to you all the time. As I was thinking about biblical riches this week, that's what came to mind, is this park. Not far from us, free, available, all the time. And when you come here, something happens to you that changes you. That's what biblical grace, what biblical mercy is like. We're in a new series today, and uh, it's called The New Abnormal. And last week we talked about abnormal sight. You know, how do we see differently? How do we see as God sees? And today the topic is abnormal wealth. How do we value what it is that God values? And what is it that God values? What is it that God is, has for us? And I want to share with you a passage. We're reading through Ephesians 2. There might be a link in the dialog box on your screen. I encourage you either in advance or later on to read through that. But if we look at verses 4 and 5, here's what we hear. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Then he adds, by grace you have been saved. So God is rich in mercy. What is the wealth of God? It's mercy and love and grace for you and me. And why would we need that? I think that uh, it's pretty obvious that we have a need. If we're honest with ourselves, we know our need. There are moments when we truly know our needs. And by our need, I mean our own fallenness, our own sin, our own need for grace. What is your need for grace? Are you authentic about your need for grace. Jesus once told this great story about a couple of men praying, and uh, one of them uh, was a religious leader, and he uh, was pretty confident of his own righteousness and faithfulness, and he went out into the main square, and he uh, prayed where everyone would see him, and uh, he prayed all the right words, and he knew exactly what to say and how to say it, and he did everything right as far as prayer goes, and uh, he said, thank God I'm not like all these other people. Thank you, God, I'm not like them. But I'm, and there was a certain righteousness, a certain self-righteousness. Then Jesus said there was another person who prayed, who knew and was authentic about his own fallenness, and he went off where no one would see him. And he prayed, and he asked for forgiveness, and he asked for God's mercy, and he pleaded for it from deep within. 
And then Jesus asked, in the end, who received mercy? Who was authentically asking for it? God is rich in mercy. The question for us is, are we authentically knowledgeable and understanding of our, need, our own need for it? And do we ask for it authentically? Because if we do, God says, God's riches are there for the taking. Abundant. And that's what God seeks to give for us. Mercy and love. There's an acronym for that. If you've been around church at all, you've probably heard it. It's an acronym for the word grace. And it's G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, it's been kind of uh, weird how people have measured riches during this whole quarantine thing. They've measured riches uh, in rolls of toilet paper. And by the way, if you are short of toilet paper, uh, be, feel free to give us a call at the church and uh, we'll see if we can find some for you if you've run out. I think it might be available now in the stores, but uh, we've got some there. Uh, give us some notice, though. Uh, but it's been so funny. You've seen pictures of people hoarding toilet paper, and now there are other shortages and things people are hoarding and things that people need. And it's kind of interesting that the wealth that we find in Christ is abundant, and it's available, and it's free the riches of Christ. God calls us to receive them. God calls us to be merciful to one another as he is merciful to us. And what scripture says is that makes us alive. Again from Ephesians. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places is Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show us, and here's the riches part, the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. The verses that I just read this morning, the, in the original Greek, it's fascinating. There are, it's all one sentence from verse 1 through 7. It's a 124-word sentence in Greek. Our English teachers don't teach us to write like that, but that's how Paul wrote it. One big string of words, one big argument, making his case. And uh, I learned Greek. I don't read the Greek. <laughs> But what the scholars of the Greek say is that what Paul is doing there is he's making this very intricate case, and his case is that grace is all God's doing. It's not something that you can make happen. It's not something that you earn. It's not something you're worthy of. It's not something that you and I deserve, because what we deserve is, you know, based on what we have done, and Paul teaches how, you know, we are in our own trespasses, in our own sin, we're fallen people, but God is rich in mercy and God is rich in grace. And it says that when grace is at work in our lives, it does something within us. And the description that Paul gives is that it makes us alive. You have been made alive in Christ. You're invited to call upon God for God's forgiveness and God's mercy. It's kind of like this park here. It's open, sunrise to sunset. It's available. You can come and receive what it has to offer. What's interesting is even when you don't expect it or don't know that you need it, something happens within you. And you experience something and you're changed. A t-shirt and a hoodie. Not really my normal preaching attire or work attire or frankly, streaming attire, but I love this hoodie. I've had it for like eight years, I think, and to the outsider, there's there's nothing significant about it. I mean, it's just a regular black hoodie that I got from Target, but I have to be honest that I value it more than a lot of my wardrobe, including some of my more expensive items. 
if I could, I would wear this hoodie every day. This morning, we're talking about abnormal wealth. And I think that abnormal wealth comes from valuing abnormal things, like say, a black hoodie from Target. Because before we can decide if we have wealth, we have to decide what we value. And here's what I think is really awesome. We get to decide what we value. It's the ultimate power we each individually have. It's why companies spend millions and billions of dollars trying to persuade us to value what they're selling us. Or they spend millions and billions of dollars trying to figure out how their product or service aligns with our values. A few years ago when grocery online ordering and delivery first became a thing, they didn't market it to people as an alternative to laziness because laziness isn't something we value. It's something we pretend not to do. No, they marketed it as a solution to the problem of busy and hectic lives and as a way for people to get to spend more time with their families because time with our families is what we value. Right now, it's, it's shifted and it's actually marketed as an alternative to going out if you don't have to because right now, above everything else, we value our safety. What I'm trying to say here is that we hold all of the cards because at the end of the day, it is ultimately up to each and every one of us to decide what it is that we value. And for that decision, we decide what it means to have wealth. One of the people um, that I watch on YouTube is a doctor and just today I was watching a video where she was talking about how if she would have been willing to relocate or if she would have been willing to work more hours, she'd be able to make a lot more money. But she said no, because above money, she wants to participate in the lives of her four kids and her husband. To have wealth to her doesn't mean having a long slew of numbers on her paycheck. A wealthy life to her means that she can spend time with her family. Every day, you get to decide what to value. You get to decide that you value above all else the gifts and blessings and relationship that God has given you. The Son of God sent down for you, the sacrifice that God made for you. So why do we have to talk about it though? Why isn't this an automatic thing? Why don't we default to valuing above all else these things in our everyday lives? It's simple. We haven't earned it. We live in a society that is driven by results, by measuring what we've earned, by working hard and picking ourselves up by our bootstraps and making ourselves successful. We've all heard the phrase that there's no such thing as a free meal. We're suspicious of receiving anything that we haven't earned. But this is different. This is more than anything you could ever earn. This is an inheritance, but it's not your typical inheritance. You don't have to fight with your siblings to see who gets the most. You can't be written off of it because maybe you didn't marry the person your parents wanted you to marry. And most importantly, in fact, far more importantly, it is a type of wealth that you receive with this inheritance that you can share without losing any of it. See, the problem with the wealth that comes with money is that during your lifetime, money comes in and then money goes out. You want to be generous and, and that's awesome, but there's always that feeling in the back of your head that 
what I give, I won't have anymore. That's not the case with this kind of wealth. In fact, it actually works the opposite way. If your wealth is God's love for you and you share that wealth with others, you may feel even closer to God than you did before. It's the kind of wealth that would only drive an investor nuts because it just doesn't make any sense. Part of our text from Ephesians this morning says, for it, has been, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. The gift of God. A few years ago, in fact, <clears throat> maybe nine years ago by now, uh, for Christmas, I got this, what I can only call a cupcake machine. Um, think like a George Foreman, but it has like holes for the cupcake batter. And then you close the lid and then you wait four minutes and then you have cupcakes. It was magical. It's where my <clears throat> kind of obsession uh, my interest, my hobby in baking really kind of kicked off. This was a gift I received so that I could share it with other people. And it's not like every time I made cupcakes for people, it took a little piece of it with it. No, I was able to use this gift to bless other people over and over and over again. Eventually, my cupcakes were actually auctioned off at a seminary fundraiser for over a thousand dollars. And in that case, I was able to give people cupcakes, but we were also able to raise money for a charity in need. We are blessed to be a blessing. That is the only strings attached to our gift if there is any. Our faith in God and our willingness to bless others with the blessings that we have received. But here's the really cool part. God's love and your salvation are even better than cupcakes. Because the problem with cupcakes, and, I'm, and, and, it, and it saddens me to find a fault with cupcakes, but the problem with cupcakes is that once you eat it, it's gone. But God's love and the salvation we receive that's forever. That's wealth. Even if it is a bit abnormal. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we give you so much thanks for your generosity. For the blessings that you have gifted us, for the son you sacrificed for us, for the salvation we receive through faith in you. Help us to be okay with receiving something that we have not earned. Help us find joy in that. Help us tell others about it. Remind us every day that we are blessed to be a blessing for others and that our abnormal wealth is a wealth we can freely share. In your name, amen.